Hello, we are gonna talk today about the five most important issues in Washington. Now, the first thing I have to acknowledge is I got to make the list. So it's really Ken's five most important issues in Washington, but I think since we're all conservatives here, you're going to see a lot of overlap if, with your list of five, if not complete overlap. So let's start at the top. First is not an issue, it's a problem. And that is the lack of leadership in a conservative direction in Washington. Leadership is the greatest need of the conservative movement in Washington, D.C. And that's not unique to today, it's happened in other eras as well. But our leadership, Paul Ryan is the Speaker of the House, he is not conservative. Mitch McConnell, <laughs> definitely not conservative. And, uh, and frankly, when you get to somebody like Mitch McConnell, he is anti-conservative. He fights harder with conservatives than he does with Democrats. Think about that for a moment. Have you ever seen Mitch McConnell fight as hard with any Democrat as you've seen him fight with, say, Ted Cruz when Ted Cruz is trying to defund Obamacare, with conservatives when they're trying to reduce budget expenditures, when they're trying to protect life or to move judges along. He never fights as hard with Democrats as he does with conservatives. Leadership is the worst problem we have in Washington, and that may not be obvious, for Republicans at a time when you have a Republican president with President Trump, you have a Republican majority, bare majority in the Senate, 51 senators, and a Republican majority in the House. You'd think we have all three of the legislative and executive uh, branches, offices, in the presidency's case, and yet we cannot move a conservative agenda. Why is that? Because the leadership is not conservative and in fact, views conservatives, including you, as the opponent. They view you as a problem. They just want your vote and then they want you to shut up and sit down. They don't wanna actually implement the things they told you they were gonna do. So problem number one in Washington is leadership. Leadership. And what can you and I do about that? Well, the main thing we can do is not only extract commitments from the people we support for Congress and the Senate, to change the leadership. That means throwing Mitch McConnell out and replacing him with a conservative. It means when Paul Ryan retires, replacing him with a true dedicated conservative. Not someone who says they're a conservative today, but will give those principles up to go in the leadership, but someone with a dedicated commitment to those principles, even when it's hard for them. Uh, that's what we need, and that's what you can do, and it's what I can do. So we need to fix the leadership problem in Washington. The second issue is a more traditional issue, and that is judges. Moving conservative judges through the Senate and getting them on the bench. It may shock you to learn that we have more vacancies now, today, or near future, than we have ever had since the judiciary became as big as it is today. And you say, well, wait a minute, but President Trump came into office in January of 2017. Haven't we been whittling down the number of vacancies? No, the number of vacancies has been going up. More judges are retiring than the Senate is approving. President Trump, as of this taping, has nominated judges to fill over half of those vacancies, and yet they sit in the Senate. Why do they sit in the Senate when judges are the number one priority for conservative voters, for religious voters on the right? They are our biggest priority. Poll after poll shows that. I know that. They are for me. They are for you. We know this. So why do they sit? They sit because the Senate is working two and a half days a week. Now, if you worked two and a half days a week, how long would you be able to keep working wherever that was? Yeah, me too. I'd be fired like that and so would you. 
but apparently in the House of Lords, I mean in the Senate, the U.S. Senate, two and a half days is a long week. They come in late on Tuesday, maybe have a vote or two Tuesday evening, work all day Wednesday. Whoo! Part of the day Thursday and fly home. That's a common week for the U.S. Senate. Thank you, Mitch McConnell. So what's the result? The result is that as of this taping, there are 178 judicial vacancies. 178. And there are, there were 137 on the day Donald Trump was sworn in as President Trump. That is a near 40% increase in the number of vacancies since President Trump was sworn into office. That is an unacceptable failure in Washington. Now, it isn't just judges. The Trump administration has complained heartily at the lack of approval for their executive branch nominees, things like deputy secretaries of state or of defense and so forth across the administration because it makes it harder for them to implement their agenda until these are put in place. A, uh, a Trump administration person was interviewed by the Washington Post, that noted bastion of the right wing, the Washington Post, recently, and they said that it would take nine and a half years at the current pace to get all of their executive slots filled. And even the Washington Post, went back. that reporter went back to their office, did the math, and had to concede that that is correct. Well, of course, we both know that even if President Trump gets reelected in 2020, he will have at most eight years in office, not nine and a half. So why is this happening? Mitch McConnell would tell you that it's Chuck Schumer's fault and those pesky Democrats because they keep stalling. Well, do they? Yes. Yes, they do. They are using the debate limits of the Senate to try to slow down both judicial nominations from getting confirmed and executive nominations from getting confirmed. Nonetheless, the Democrats themselves five years ago got rid of the filibuster for these situations. There is no filibuster. There's no Nothing but a majority vote is required, and yet the Senate isn't moving judges and isn't moving President Trump's nominees. And we're almost halfway through President Trump's first term, and they are so far behind that they would have to work seven days a week uh, for months at a time to get through this. Now, let me go back to the Democrat obstruction. You hear this from Mitch McConnell all the time. He complains. He always blames somebody else. It's always somebody else's fault if you're Mitch McConnell. And I want to ask you this. If roles were reversed, if the Democrats had a bare majority of the U.S. Senate and there was a Democrat president whose nominees were moving along at less than a snail's pace, I mean, we're literally approving judges at the rate of about one a month. One a month when there's 178 vacancies. That's outrageous. It's outrageous. And, he, and Mitch McConnell blames the Democrats. Well, if roles were reversed, do you think the Democrats would accept that? Do you think perhaps they would change the rules? I think they'd have done it like that. They would have put up with this for about two weeks, but Mitch McConnell has put up with it for two years. He's an obstructionist himself, and we need to demand senators to get their to push Mitch McConnell to change the rules of the Senate so judges can fill these slots, so the Trump administration can get their executive nominees voted on and confirmed. That is the second big issue uh, in Washington right now. Leadership is first, and of course it affects things like judges, but other executive nominations getting through the Senate. The work ethic in the U.S. Senate is terrible. If it barely exists, they hardly work at all, and then they go back home. <clears throat> if you show up on a Monday or Friday, it's a ghost town on the Senate side of the Capitol. The third issue, and this is long-term, probably the biggest single one that we face as a country, and that is 
uh, the budget situation, particularly our massive debt. $21 trillion and counting, more, far more than the size of our economy. Historically unprecedented level of debt. And this is in peacetime with, under President Obama said, hey, we've got this great economic recovery. It was a very slow recovery. It was, it was an upward trend line, but it was a slow one. Nonetheless, debts are for when you have crises, war, for instance. But we're borrowing massive amounts of money simply because we have congressmen and women and senators on both sides of the aisle who simply won't say no to anything. My wife and I joke, our, uh, our seventh child, our last son, is named Maximilian William Wilberforce Cuccinelli. <laughs> My wife wanted to name him after Maximilian Colby, a saint who was martyred in World War II, uh, stepping in um, uh, a Holocaust camp in place of others. And I wanted to name him after William Wilberforce, who I consider to be uh, the greatest legislator in the history of the world, except maybe for Cicero. And he's the, he's the legislator in Britain who got rid of slavery in that country. It took him a long, long time to do it. So we have what I jokingly refer to as a government compromise. My wife got what she wanted, and I got what I wanted. So he's now Maximilian William Wilberforce Cuccinelli. And unfortunately, that just takes up space on a birth certificate. Government compromises in budgets on Capitol Hill bury Max and all of your children in a mountain of debt because Congressman A gets what he wants and Congresswoman B gets what she wants. Their compromise isn't to cut what they want, it's, to, it's that both of them get it and they run your children's credit card. The level of irresponsibility here is extraordinary. The level of denial of reality that reality, that reality being called mathematics, <laughs> pure numbers, is astonishing. It is absolutely astonishing. And um, we all saw what happened when the Greeks couldn't pay their government debt. There were riots in the streets, and I mean everybody was rioting. This wasn't just you know, some section of, uh, of town that rose up. This was across their country. They were having civil war nearly over the sudden and complete cutoff of government services and support. Well, Greece's economy is the size of Boston, Massachusetts. And yet that's what happened in the birthplace of democracy. And also keep in mind that when the Greeks hit the wall, the Germans and other Europeans came and bailed them out. When you're America and you are the world's reserve currency, there is no one to bail you out. And if they just print dollars to solve the problem, then every penny you've saved is going to be reduced in value very, very fast. We're going to look like Argentina and Brazil in the 1980s and 90s. We'll look like a banana republic unless we start working our way toward a balanced budget. And that means for real working toward a balanced budget. Um, and these proposals are made. Senator Rand Paul earlier this year made a proposal to get to a balanced budget in five years. This is what the proposal consisted of. It consisted of cutting every department of government by 1% each of the next five years while letting tax revenues, of course, continue to rise. After five years, the tax revenues would be projected to catch up to the spending of our government. Now, included in that spending is paying off debt and the interest on the debt, which is, so, which is eating up our budget. And as soon as those interest rates rise, interest on government debt is going to completely push out our ability to do anything else. So let me give you a real world example of how this works. So, Let's take welfare, Medicaid, which is the health care program for poor people. I don't have any problem with health care support for people who are too poor to support their own families for a time period until they can get back on their feet. And I imagine you don't either. But it's expensive. 
it's expensive. Food stamps is another example. Again, I think for some period of time, most of us would be supportive of offering food support to people who are down on their luck until they can get back on their feet. But that's not what we're doing right now. We've expanded food stamps to something closing in on 50 million people in this country. Um, Medicaid is an enormous program. So if we want to keep providing this sort of assistance to the neediest of the needy, then we're going to have to stop providing it to virtually everybody. And I don't literally mean everybody, but such a huge swath of our country. And the simple reason is, if we overspend it all now, if we borrow money to give it away, then when the crash comes, there will be no support available for the poorest of the poor. And suddenly, because of the financial debacle, there are going to be a lot more poor people. We're going to hit a hole. So if we don't discipline ourselves, meaning Congress, to start reining in our spending and bringing down that debt, the third issue of concern in Washington, then we're going to go off a cliff at some point and the people who will be hurt first and worst will be the same ones who always are, and it'll be the poor. But on that, in that case, we're all going to be affected. And we're leaving our children a legacy of debt. Um, so many of us think in our own families, I want to live a life that leaves a world that's better for my children. We are systematically, our government is systematically creating a financial world that is worse for our children. And unless we demand it of our elected officials that they begin to stop kicking the can down the road and address the budget problems and the debt problems that they have built up over the years, we're going to be leaving our children with a very poor legacy indeed. Very poor legacy indeed. So leadership, judges and other appointments, and the budget and its accompanying debt are three of the top issues in Washington. My fourth issue is immigration. Immigration touches on a number of things. It touches on our sovereignty. Are we a nation of borders or aren't we? Um, it touches on our national security. Uh, drug cartels use our lax immigration enforcement as a highway for them to move their products in and out of our country. Gang members cross our southern border with regularity. I know as a former attorney general, the greatest violent crime threat in Virginia while I was attorney general was a gang known as MS-13. You may have heard President Trump talk about it. In various parts of the country where MS-13 dominates, it is an extremely violent gang. And, and look, gangs typically today are just illegal businesses. They run prostitution rings, they run sex trafficking rings, they sell drugs, uh, and, a, and a list of other things um, that are illegal, for one, that victimize people in our communities and people around the world. Human trafficking is one of the things these gangs do. And this is all allowed across our national borders because of our completely lax national uh, security at the border. I, I said it affects national security. Of course, terrorists are coming in too. But the real offenders on the security front are the gangs. Uh, but on the inside of our country, we also see the erosion of our sovereignty with simple things like who gets to vote. As we approach 2020, who's going to count for the census? And this is where sanctuary cities and states come into play. So let's look at California. And I don't know these numbers exactly, but you'll get the concept as I throw these out there. Um, California has about one of every eight Americans living there. So that means that there are about 40 million Americans living in California, just under 40 million. Well, if there's another 4 million illegals living in California um, because they invite them in quite happily, but I live in Virginia and perhaps we're not so welcoming so even relatively speaking, we have many less. They could have 
five or six additional congressmen after the census simply because of the illegal aliens in their state. Well, is that fair to those of us in Virginia? Of course not. Of course not. So it affects our elections in that way, but it also affects our elections because some of these folks actually get signed up to vote. And I always find it suspicious that the Democrats fight so hard against ballot security and against identifying who really are citizens and who should be voting in our elections. This is a, a question of sovereignty, both at the border and at the ballot box. It is a question of national security at our border as it relates to both terrorism and particularly the drug trade, um, but also human trafficking as it relates to gangs. This is a very serious issue. And again, I started off by pointing out leadership as a problem. Republican leadership doesn't want to address this. President Trump ran on fighting illegal immigration and he has been stymied by the Republican leadership, not just the Democrats, but Republican leadership at actually reforming our immigration system to make it work for those who are playing by the rules and to get rid of, meaning deport, those who aren't. And until we fix our leadership, we're gonna have a hard time fixing our immigration problem, but it's absolutely critical to securing our sovereignty and our security. Is, so my fourth item would be immigration particularly illegal immigration. So we have leadership, judges and other appointments, budget and the debt, and the fourth issue is immigration. The fifth issue, you've heard me talk about a little bit, um, it relates to the budget and debt, and that is the entitlements. The entitlement problems that we have in this country are um, not controlled year to year, they're not budgeted for, they're on cruise control. And I'm talking about Social Security, I'm talking about Medicare, I'm talking about Medicaid, which is a welfare program, another one known as TANF, which is also a welfare program, it's income support. Uh, food stamps, again, these are all entitlements. The big ones are the ones that don't get touched year to year. So Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. They're all done on formulas year to year, and they're huge. They're the biggest pieces of our budget. We're never gonna solve the budget problem without addressing entitlements. That's why they get their own category. Now, Paul Ryan has talked about entitlements for a long, long time, and he's been very thoughtful about his concerns about what they're doing to our country, both culturally and financially. As we saw with welfare reform in 1996, when you demand that those getting welfare actually do work, lo and behold, they do work. And the dignity for a human being that comes with doing work and not being dependent can't have a value put on it. It's priceless. It's also a cultural mentality. America is getting lazy. There are a lot of us that have that concern. You probably share that concern with me. When you look at entitlements like Medicaid, you can see where that comes from. If we don't fix Social Security, if we don't fix Medicare, they will collapse. It isn't a simple question of deciding to let them go on as they are. They can't go on as they are. There will literally not be dollars to mail out to retired people if Social Security is not reformed. And the reforms it screams out for our means testing, uh, I'll put it in sort of Democrat terms, rich people don't need Social Security. Social Security was set up to keep the poor who are elderly at a livable level. It wasn't a retirement program, it was never a retirement program. And a lot of us look at it now as a retirement program and think of it as one, that is not what Social Security is. Social Security is to keep the elderly from being impoverished. And if we could return it to that program and only that program, it could survive. To do that, it has to be um, means tested. And for younger folks, it should be privatized. Turn it into 401ks. You can make them mandatory, but the government doesn't own it, you own it. 
until we face up to the political will necessary to make those simple fixes, we're going to keep seeing Social Security spiral downward. Medicare is similar but worse because of the skyrocketing health care costs. And Medicare is a form of socialized medicine. It's one size fits all medicine for those 55 and over. And it doesn't work. Uh, financially, it certainly doesn't work. And it also doesn't provide the best care. Uh, when you couple it with Obamacare that's been in place for the last five years, it's really doing great damage to our ability to be the top health care provider in the world. Um, we're so expensive in this country now that we're pricing ourselves out of medical care. And what's happening is that because the government is destroying our market for health care through Medicare and through Obamacare, um, all new options are opening up and there are these fringe markets in healthcare arising. Well, the solution, as we see those examples, is to get government out of the way. It's to get government out of the way. People think, oh gosh, it isn't working, we need to do more, we being government. No, no, no. Government needs to get out. Get out. And that, for many people, it feels like, oh, but it's my teddy bear, it's my insurance policy, it's what makes me feel safe. But think about it yourself. Do you believe government does anything well? Do you tell jokes about the post office? Do you tell jokes about the DMV? What do they do well? They defend our country well. That's about it. And even that they do expensively. There is nothing government does that can't be done better elsewhere aside from their most basic function of providing safety and security for this country. Nobody else can step in to do that other than our government. Healthcare was provided just fine, thank you, and cost effectively until government got into the game. And until government gets out, that entitlement will continue to drag our budget down and it'll be a burden on our children without providing them healthcare. And it'll deny them the opportunities for innovation in healthcare that will raise the quality of their life. And the sooner our government gets out of the way, the better. So those, are, those entitlements are dragging our country's government financially downward. They're also creating an entitlement mentality. People expect government to care for them, cradle to grave. That is not the attitude of the America that became exceptional. American exceptionalism starts with self-reliance. And our entitlement programs are killing the mentality, the culture of self-reliance that helped Americans make America an exceptional nation. So if we were to address those five issues, leadership, judges and other executive appointments, the budget and the debt that goes along with it, solve the immigration, especially illegal immigration problems we have, and address entitlements, We'd be on track for another 250 years as the greatest country on earth, and I hope we get there. Thank you for joining me today.